And all God's people said, Good morning, I'm Brother Scott, the pastor of the church. Welcome to First United Methodist Church Garland, where we are cultivating Christian community, living faith, loving God, serving others, and inspiring hope. If you are a first-time visitor here, I want to extend an extra special warm welcome to you. And to those who are watching via live stream, good morning and welcome. Um, I want to thank Diane for uh, filling in on piano this morning, and uh, Kelly is filling in for Kitty. Kitty is out with the youth uh, choir on their retreat, so we have a uh, guest pianist for, because Eldred is still out for the month, and uh, we're, there, there Kelly is, lost track of him. <laughs> you know, he's not sitting in Kitty's chair, you know, things aren't right, you know. AC update. You all ready for this? They have begun work. <laughs> Middle of last week, they got the compressors out. We are making progress. So soon and very soon, we will be back worshiping in the sanctuary. Not next week, but pray for the week after. The uh, Chamber Works Orchestra has been here all week, so our halls have been filled with the sounds of young musicians playing uh, all of their stringed instruments, including the harp, um, all week. It has been a joy and a pleasure. They will be here for the next week as well. So if you just need to come sit and listen to some uh, young musicians practice, just sneak by sometime uh, throughout the week. With that, I invite you to stand in body or spirit as you are able and join in our call to worship as printed in the bulletin. In the midst of trouble, we cry aloud to God. God brings us up out of our trouble and sets us in a safe place. The Lord has turned our mourning into dancing. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as you are able and join in to God be the glory.
Oh, now we're complete. I, I was going to let you sit down, but you can stand up. extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful ones. Give thanks to God's holy name. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Surely the Lord's anger is but for a moment. The Lord's favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry, for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I shall my posterity, I shall never be moved. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful ones, give thanks to God's all.
children, will you please come? Come, come. So who here knows how to pray? Some hands, but not all hands. So how do you pray? My mom says that you thank God first, then you ask God to forgive your sins, then you say your prayers or actually something. Because if you, if you ask for God to forgive your sins first, then you forgive your sins and your prayers are more likely to be answered. All right, all right. That was a fantastic answer. Did y'all hear that? Oh, I heard it, and it was a fantastic answer. So, <laughs> who else knows how to pray? How do you pray? Uh, I, I, I pray, I pray the Lord's Prayer, like our Father. Yeah. That's feedback. That's what happens when microphones are too, too loud. So you pray the Lord's Prayer. How do you pray? Uh, I pray to God. You pray to God? How do you pray? I, I pray, I pray, I bow my head. You bow your head? And I close my eyes. And you close your eyes? Yep. How do you pray? Me. Yeah, you do what you do. Do what your mommy has you do. Yeah. yeah. And daddy. Okay, one more, one more. I do it like neighbor because me and Fer and Abraham and Tom yeah, and Emmanuel yeah, yeah, are all yeah, whole family, yeah, mommy, so we pray yeah, the same yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, we pray yeah, first yeah, thanks, yeah. then forgiveness, then asking. So, so, so what? What she said is we first pray for. Uh, uh, Thanks, and then we ask for forgiveness, and then we ask for things. So I'm going to teach you, those are all fantastic. You guys are professionals. So I'm going to teach you not the professional stuff, but the beginner stuff. Okay, so you already know the professional stuff, so we're going to go back to basic training. We're going to go back to spring training, okay? Three words. Three words. Wow. 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 Hey, you think of things that make you say, wow. Uh, art. art makes you say, wow. Science makes you say, wow. Magic, Magic make, music makes you say, wow. Yes. You guys are so smart. Kiss your brain. So beautiful, beautiful views like the Grand Canyon or mountains make me say, wow. And so we. You haven't? You've got to go. It's beautiful. So we say wow because we, we're thanking God, like you said, for how great the world is. The next, the next thing we say, in the next word, so wow is the first one. Thanks is the second one. Thank you. Thank you. What do you thank, what do you thank other people for? Uh, for helping me. For what? For helping me. For helping you, yeah. Yeah, so when they help you carry stuff or help you with that, yeah. For playing with you when no one wants to play with you. For playing with you when no one wants to play with you, yeah. Sit by you at, sit by you at lunch. Sit by you at lunch. Do you thank people for sitting by you at lunch? Actually, we, um, at my school, we're not allowed to sit wherever we want. We just go in our number order. Oh, you go in number order? Yeah. Yeah, including my school number. So, wow, thanks. And the third one for basic training, the third one for spring training is help. help you. So, 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 so like when you ask God for stuff, when you ask God for help. So this is the easiest prayer you can pray. Wow. Thanks. Help. And help. So you don't need this because you already got this. You're already a professional. You already know what to do. But for the rest of the amateurs out here, 
<laughs> right? If you don't know what to pray, start with wow. If you don't know what to pray, say thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And if you don't know what to pray, ask for help. Help me. Help me. You guys are so good. You guys are awesome. All right, so I'm going to ask you to help me. You all ready to pray? Yeah. Let's pray. And so you can either close your eyes and bow your head. You can stand up and do, put, spread your arms out. Whatever makes you feel like you're connected to God. You can pray like this. I promise you can. All right, everybody pray. Wow. Wow. Thanks. Help. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. Thank you very much. I could claim credit for that, but I can't. Um, a lady named Barbara Brown Taylor, who is an Episcopalian theologian and priest, wrote a book titled, Wow, Thanks, Help. And um, if you need help with your prayer life, I highly recommend picking it up. Um, I don't think it's written for kids, but it works with kids as well. Our scripture lesson for today comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 11th chapter. Listen now for the word of the Lord. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John has taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Give us each our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go into him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. He answered from within, do not bother me, the door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed and I cannot give up, get up to give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give anything because he, he is at, at rest, at least because of his persistence, he will give up, get up and give him whatever he needs. And so I ask, say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks you for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if your child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you, then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? My sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks Amen. So uh, when I teach people who are training to be pastors at Perkins School of Theology, or when I teach local pastors who are going through course of study, I ask the students in these classes to lead prayer every time we meet. I ask for volunteers, and if no one puts their hand up, I say, a Methodist pastor should always be ready to do three things, preach, pray, and die. <laughs> I am only asking you to do the easiest one. And usually somebody volunteers very quickly after that gentle reminder. Discipleship 
is hard. Shepherding disciples is hard. Praying, however, should not be. So growing up, my Mennonite grandpa wasn't a man of big words. He had finished the third grade. I'm not saying he was dumb. He just had a limited education because that's what you needed to be a farmer in West Kansas at that point in time. His vocabulary was not large. But when he would pray at dinner, suddenly he would become loquacious and extremist. Now I call this stained glass language. He had flowery language he'd use about beseeching the sovereign and almighty father. Now, around the house, he often spoke Suddeutsch with grandma and the pastor at the Mennonite church they went um, preached in Suddeutsch. And so I just figured that my grandpa was still praying in this foreign language that I didn't know. No, it was English. It was 17th century English, but English nonetheless. But for grandpa, prayer required this particular dialect to be effective. To pray, you must pray the right way, in the right language. This flowery, ornate, 17th century stained glass language. Otherwise, God wouldn't hear it. And the stained glass language had to be just the right color. So in the past few decades, I've noticed a similar trend with a completely different dialect. And this particular dialect tends to downplay every expression of gratitude or request. The word just shows up quite a lot. And it usually comes after the Lord's name and before the second, plur- or the, yeah, after the second person plural pronoun. And it all gets smushed together into one word. You've been in Texas, so you know this word. It's Jesus Weegis. Josh got a laugh. (laughs) Jesus Weegis has not made it into any dictionary that I've checked, but in this style of prayer, Jesus Weegis shows up every sentence or two. I've thought about starting to talk to people who pray this way in the way that they pray. Can you imagine a conversation that goes like this? Bob, my dear friend, we just want to thank you, Bob, for how, Bob, you've helped us clean up the bathroom, Bob. We just appreciate it just so much and just want to, Bob, express our deep and profound appreciation, Bob, for all your time and effort. You've heard these prayers, haven't you? I'll stop before I get accused of picking on people who pray this way. It's still stained glass language, it's just of a different style. So what connects my grandpa's 17th century, we beseech thee, thou, O Lord, and the Jesus we just prayers? I think it's a belief that God only listens or only hears us if we pray in the right way. They disagree on what the right way is, but they both assume that we need to use the right way or God won't listen or respond or something. As so often happens, these religious folks seem not to have paid adequate attention to Jesus. The disciples ask Jesus how to pray, and Jesus gives them what we call the Lord's Prayer, which is simple, clear, and almost naive in how easy it is. Now, the version that most of us have memorized dates back to the 17th century, which makes it seem more flowery and complicated than it really is. We have memorized this 17th century stained glass version of a very simple prayer. And we have been taught to assume that for our prayers to be effective, we got to use this same kind of stained glass language. So that's one way. But like most things in life, there is going too far to one side or the other. 
This one side is that if we don't pray in the right way, God won't hear you or won't respond. Too far to the other way is thinking that prayer doesn't change anything about God. That God doesn't respond to prayers at all. So in the past few weeks, I've seen a meme going around on Facebook, and I'm going to call out Bradley Fletcher because he shared it recently, and I commented on him for uh, reading ahead in my sermon notes. Um, it's a quote by a Danish philosopher and pastor, Sorn Kierkegaard. And for the record, I love Kierkegaard. Uh, I think Kierkegaard and I are cut from the same cloth. He was a troublemaker. I agree with him on a good number of things. I also know that he wrote a lot of stuff ironically. And you can't read him straight every time because a lot of stuff he wrote was not what he actually thought. He would write it under someone else's name and he would turn the volume up as loud as he could to make his point to make clear how absurd the other side was. I did it just a minute ago. You watched me do it with the Jesus We Just prayers. Right? And this is how Kierkegaard would write. But instead of doing it for a sentence or two like I did a moment ago, Kierkegaard would do it for an entire article. And he would write it under a nickname and he would publish it under someone else's name just to make it clear that he was doing this in a character. I say this to say you've got to be careful when reading Kierkegaard because he might not be defending his position, but quite the opposite. Having said that, I think the quote that's circulating in this meme is actually Kierkegaard's position. And what the meme says is that the purpose of prayer isn't to change God, it's to change us. I disagree, but I can see how Kierkegaard got there. In one of his last sermons he preached, right before he died, he talked about how God is absolutely unchangeable. Nothing ever changes about God. Prayer can't change God because God doesn't change. And yet, Jesus says exactly the opposite. I love you, Kierkegaard, but you got it wrong. His entire life, Kierkegaard's entire life, was centered around getting the nominally Christian, those who called themselves Christian, in his country to be real Christians, just like Wesley did a century earlier in England. He was trying to get the good Danish Lutherans to actually read what Jesus said and live by it. And so at this point, I have to turn back to Kierkegaard and say, Sorn, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says that you can annoy God into getting out of bed and giving you a few loaves if you just keep pounding on the door. He might throw them directly at your head from the second story window out of annoyance, but you'll get them. And like a father who knows how to give good things to his children who ask, God does respond to our prayers. I take the point that if prayer doesn't change us, then praying is probably worthless. If all we do is pray for peace in the world, but we don't change ourselves and work to change the world to be more peaceful, we are probably failing in our discipleship. If we pray that the hungry are fed, but we don't feed the hungry, we surely aren't living into who God is calling us to be. But if we pray that God's will is done here on earth, then we'd best be prepared to do God's will. Our prayers ought to change us. So often after a tragedy, we send thoughts and prayers to those living through the horror and they respond with, we don't need thoughts and prayers. We need bottles of water, or we need an end to this senseless violence. We should pay attention. Prayers are good, but better still is prayers backed up by action. So the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. 
He doesn't give them flowery language. No matter how pretty the stained glass language like hallowed be thy name sounds, it really means you are awesome or wow. The word for father here is daddy, Abba. The translators of the King James Version of the Bible did us a disservice by making it prettier than it really is. And all of the rest of the prayer is us asking for stuff. Jesus teaches us to ask, make the world be like how you know it should be. Give us the food we need for today. Forgive us when we mess up. Help us to forgive others when they hurt us. And keep us safe from dangers and trials. Jesus doesn't say pray because it's going to change you. Jesus says pray because it will change the world. Every single point is asking God to do something for us. And as his brother, St. James, wrote, the prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. If asking God for something is only supposed to change us, every prayer should be, every prayer instead should be, God, change me to not feel hungry when my belly is empty, rather than give us our daily bread. Or, we know that your will is done perfectly on earth and in heaven, so keep things exactly as they are and change us to accept them exactly as they are. No! We want your will to be done on earth because we see everywhere we look that it isn't. We want to be part of your will being done. People are hungry and we all have needs. Most of us here do need to learn to be more content with simple things, but that's not the prayer that Jesus taught. So the rest of our lesson for today is Jesus telling the disciples that it is okay to ask. If you need bread, go annoy your friends until they give you some, even at 3 o'clock in the morning. That doesn't sound like Jesus is saying, don't ask for bread, ask for you to feel like you're full to me. It also sounds like we ought to be willing to get up at 3 a.m. when a friend comes asking for bread. Now, I'm allergic to wheat, and we don't have bread in our house, so please do not come by my door knocking at 3 a.m., because I'm not going to have any for you. Josh might. (laughs) So why do people find solace in Kierkegaard's quote? I think it becomes... It's because what Jesus says seems absurd in the face of all of the evidence. All of us know that we ask and don't receive. We hunger and thirst for righteousness, and we know that justice is lacking everywhere we look. It's easier to retreat into believing that prayer is there only to change us than it is to accept that sometimes the prayer we prayed might not be the right prayer. Is every prayer answered in the way that we want? We all know that they're not. I pray for miracles every day, and they almost never happen the way that I would like for them to happen. I have seen a few miracles that defy all explanation. The answer to many prayers is no. Sometimes the answer to a prayer is not yet. A good parent knows that a child throwing a tantrum for a candy bar will not be a better person for getting the candy bar. You might think you want a scorpion, but God knows better. Take the egg and rejoice. Sometimes the answer to prayer is, you got work to do. I don't know why some prayers are quickly answered, but most aren't. I don't know why many prayers are answered with silence, but that should not stop us from praying. 
It should not stop us for asking. It should not stop us from a- for asking for miracles. It might require us to reflect on what it is that we're asking, and maybe that we need to er- learn to ask for better things, but not, as Kierkegaard suggested, that we not ask. Several times in the last month, I've gone into our sanctuary without heat or without AC and in this heat, and I have prayed, God, make me worthy and wise enough to shepherd this congregation to where you need for them to be. And several times the answer has come a moment later with another meeting about the facilities or about the budget, and it makes me wish that I had done a business degree instead of a doctorate in theology. (laughs) That isn't going to stop me from asking. It means that I have got work to do on myself to be ready for this prayer to be answered. It's not going to stop me from asking. Thanks be to God that we are not only allowed, but instructed to ask. And we ask believing that we will be given the good things that we need. Amen and amen. As we proclaim, there we go, as we proclaim what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. So I only have a few announcements this morning. Good Samaritan, you guys know we're still collecting the chili for Good Samaritan, and that will be through the month of July. So we, we haven't gotten a lot of chili in. We really, really want to make this really good for, the, for Good Samaritan in our community. These people are really in need of food. So let's get these, the chili in and get these pantries filled at Good Sam. Also, school supplies. We're, we're collecting school supplies through the end of July as well. And uniforms. We have not gotten many uniforms in. So if we please 
asking these kids at Freeman Elementary are really in need of these uniforms. So let's go do some shopping and get some uniforms in. Last but not least, coffee bar volunteers. We need some volunteers to help the Cell family with the coffee bar. We are doing a training next Sunday. So Mike will be able to show us how, what he does when he's here at eight o'clock in the morning. So we can get some help. If Mike doesn't do the coffee bar, guess what? We will not have any coffee. So come on guys, if you're interested in, in volunteering, come see me and let's sign up and get the Cell family some help manning that coffee bar. Thank you. The part of the witness that we share with one another in our prayers is our celebrations. It's good and it's right for us to lift each other up and to celebrate the good and wonderful things that God is doing in our lives. And every person in this room, I'm sure if you were to think back over the last week or two, you could find a blessing, maybe two, where somebody has made your day or your life a little better. I hope and I pray that in your weekly prayers, you're remembering them and you're lifting them up and thanking God. For all of you that are continuing to volunteer here at our church with your time, with your presence, with your gifts, we celebrate you and we thank you and we lift you up in prayer and celebration to God this morning. I also know that there are some of you here this morning that may be here with a heart that's troubled, with a heart that is burdened, a loved one, a friend, perhaps yourself, struggling in some way. This morning, we want you to know that you are not alone. If you look around this room, we are a family. This is a community that gathers together to pray with you and for you. And as we heard Brother Scott say earlier, it's okay to ask. It's okay to ask for help for you. It's okay to ask for help for others. So this morning as we enter into this holy time of prayer, I invite you to center yourself by placing your feet on the floor and taking a deep breath, allowing yourself to be open and receptive. Would you pray with me this morning? Loving and merciful God, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the air that we breathe. We thank you for the many gifts that are bestowed on us in our daily lives. We give you thanks for the people that show up, and we give you thanks for those that are the hands and feet of Christ. We celebrate this morning all of those people in our lives that we know that are doing the work. We lift them up and we give thanks. And God, this morning we give you thanks for this church, for the ability for us to minister to this community, for those that are willing to put in the time and the effort that it takes to go out and do the work. So for each of those, we lift them up and we give thanks and we celebrate. And God, this morning as we gather, for those that are here that are hurting, for those that are here that are filled with sorrow or trouble or concern, God, we ask that you would touch them, that they would feel your presence, that you would send someone to be the face of God for them. We pray for all of those that are outside in the heat that have nowhere to go. We pray for all of those that are suffering and that are in trouble. We pray for all of those that are in this community that we know and that we don't know. And God, this morning we pray for our church, for the leadership in the church, for those who volunteer. We pray for those that are here that are doing the work. We pray for those that can't be here that are homebound. And God, we pray for the world that we live in. We would pray that there would be peace 
that there would be understanding, that there would be courage, people courageous enough to have tough conversations and listen. And God, we pray for all of those that have died, that have gone on before us. And this morning we would say, Lord, in your goodness and in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, this morning I pray that as we pray the Lord's Prayer, that our hearts would be open, that we would be convicted and encouraged to live out this prayer in our daily lives. So we lift this prayer up to you now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Baboons, baboons are the frat boys of the Serengeti. This is important, and Clay Womack taught me to say, and something's important, you say it twice, so I'm going to say it again. Baboons are the frat boys of the Serengeti. These animals with uh, opposable thumbs are tearing up these communities. They're wreaking havoc on the infrastructure, unscrewing light bulbs and smashing them in the ground. They're going through the trash. They're throwing keggers. And something has to be done about these baboons. Well, there's a solution. What they figured out is they dig little holes in the ground, pocket-sized holes, and they put candy in it. And the baboon wants that candy, and he grabs the candy, and once he reaches his hand around it, he can't pull his hand out of the pocket, out of the hole. And now he's trapped. If he lets go, he doesn't get the candy. So he stays held there until he can be rounded up and they can move him to a safe place where we don't have to worry about the baboons for a while. Generosity is a grace lesson. Thank you, Clay. Generosity is a grace lesson. We're all here for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is for, to learn something about grace. And so this is a stewardship moment. <laughs> And so I urge you to be generous. Don't be trapped with your hands in your pockets. <laughs> give generously. There are three ways to give. You can text, you can do it by computer, you can write a check. Thanks.
seek, ask, knock. Go into the world as people who believe in prayer and believe in miracles, knowing that we will be transformed and the world will be transformed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.